Hello and welcome to the Thanksgiving show. What are you grateful for this year? I am grateful for you. All of you who are listening to the show, the audience has grown and so has the subscriber base. Thank you so much for allowing me to come out here in the solar powered shed each day and learn along with you with my excellent guests. Joining me today on the Thanksgiving Day show, our favorite historian, Professor Kenneth C. Davis, stops by to talk to us about the real history of Thanksgiving. We also take a look back at this week in history, the Nuremberg trials, the assassination of JFK. Great conversation with Professor Ken C. Davis, as always. And for the first time on the podcast, my old friend from SiriusXM, Joe Madison of Urban View, the Black Eagle, civil rights leader, human rights leader, and hero of mine, has gone on a hunger strike until there is action on voting rights. And right through Thanksgiving holiday, Joe Madison is... Continuing this hunger strike, day 17. Joe and I caught up yesterday, and that will be part of today's show as well. Can I see Davis, Joe Madison, both joining me here on Thanksgiving Day. Why are you listening on Thanksgiving? Are you are you driving somewhere? Maybe you're not listening on Thanksgiving. Maybe it's the day after. Either way, I'm so happy to have you, and I really hope that you will not miss tomorrow's show, the Friday show as well. Just going to be a conversation with Dr. Aaron Carroll and me about his worst year ever. He lost both his parents and his best friend, also had a really scary accident. And we talked about that and so much more. That will post for tomorrow, and I'm really excited to share that with you. It was was an amazing conversation with one of my best friends and the smartest person I know, Dr. Aaron Carroll. That is tomorrow. But right now, it's time to recap yesterday's news in what we call The Last 24. All right, well, the huge story on Wednesday on Thanksgiving Eve came out of Georgia, where a jury of all white people except for one black person found three white men guilty in the death of Ahmad Arbery, guilty of multiple counts of murder. These three men shot, fatally shot Arbery on February 23rd, 2020 in Brunswick, Georgia, Neighborhood guilty of all nine counts brought against him, including malice murder. The largely white jury, like I said, began deliberations Tuesday after 10 days of testimony, discussed the case for roughly 10 hours before reaching a verdict. And now all three men are facing a potential sentence of life in prison. And I've got a roundup of reactions for you right now. Let's start with Reverend Al Sharpton, who was integral and instrumental in this and bringing attention to the case to start. Here he is with the family of the victim, Ahmad Arbery, after the verdict was announced. This mother would tell me, Reverend, we're going to win this, when I had doubts. She kept praying. This father said, we got to get some justice for my son. And let the word go forth all over the world that a jury of 11 whites and one black Come on. In the deep south, oh, that's right. God. stood up in the courtroom yes, and said that black lives do matter. Yes. Oh, yeah. Let it be clear yeah. that almost 10 years after Trayvon, God used Wanda yeah. and Marcus's yeah. son to prove that if we kept marching and kept fighting, we would make you hear us. Well, let's get one clip from the defense attorney in this case. His name is Jason Sheffield. He says the guilty verdict for Maude Arbery's killers will be appealed. I've lived with these men for the last year and a half, day in and day out. I've looked into their hearts. I've looked into their souls. I've had very deep conversations with them that stem back to their childhood and their upbringing. And I can tell you, honestly, these men are sorry for what happened to Ahmaud Arbery. They are sorry that he is dead. They are sorry for the tragedy that happened because of the choices that they made to go out there and try to stop him. Okay, well, they can be as sorry as they want to be, but they're now going to jail together. And now here is the lead prosecutor in the case. Her name is Linda Dunikowski. Evidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The verdict today was a verdict based on the facts. Yes. Based on the evidence. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that was our goal, was to bring that to that jury so that they could do the right thing. Because the jury system works in this country. Mm -hmm. And when you present the truth to people and they can see it, they will do the right thing. And that's what this jury did today in getting justice for Ahmaud Arbery. Thank you. All right. Well, let's get some legal analysis from the great Laura Coates, who is the best of the best at explaining these things. And she does it in a cogent and powerful and passionate way here on CNN yesterday. Laura Coates with Ana Cabrera. 
yesterday. This is almost four minutes of analysis, and I think every word matters, because after all, it is Laura Coates. This was absolutely the right call, and this is the essence of justice. However, we were talking about the loss of life of a 25-year-old jogger whose mother's been inside that courtroom, whose father's been inside that courtroom, where the final thing that the jury saw was who Ahmaud Arbery was before he encountered these three men, three strangers, who felt entitled for him to stop simply because they thought that they had some authority to get somebody who was jogging to stop and talk to him. And when he didn't, they pulled out a shotgun and he was shot and killed. And remember in that video, which is so graphic and so horrible to look at, even then he tried to run and the adrenaline was kicking in and he fell again. Remember, this is somebody who tried to run away for five minutes until he was cornered, could run no more. And it was the idea of having all three men accountable. Roddy Bryan, of course, said initially that he was only a witness to the crime. But in reality, the jurors were not persuaded by that. Although he did videotape it, he played an active role. The father, Greg McMichael, who was on the back of the truck, played an active role in pursuing. Travis McMichael, who was the person who actually shot him, played an active role. But this case comes down to, one, the absence of a claim, a viable claim of self-defense. The idea, even when Travis McMichael took the stand and said, no, he never threatened me. No, I don't recall Max trying to take the gun. No, he never shouted at me. How could you possibly make a case in that point for self-defense. But more importantly, in the world of Georgia, they have a party to the crime expansive statute that says, look, if you aided and abetted in some way the commission of a crime, you were as guilty as the person who pulled the trigger. Here, Travis Michael pulled the trigger. That's not in dispute. The other two men aided and abetted, hunting this man down. Why? Because they wanted him to stop. Not because they had some viable color of law or authority. These are three people who are, for all intents and purposes, are laymen. And the prosecution did a phenomenal job ensuring that the jurors saw that each of these men were culpable and that there was no self-defense claim. But I, I caution people when I say this, and I say this is justice in action. This is really a traumatic experience for this family, a traumatic experience for the nation, one in which justice could never fully be realized when you have the loss of someone's life. But in Georgia, each of these three men, the men that took away the life of somebody's son, somebody's loved one, a human being, they will now serve the rest of their lives in jail. And, Anna, this is not the end of it. They now right. will have a federal hate crime yep. trial. And I wanted to make one more point here, Anna, if I could. A law was made about the racial composition of this jury. The idea is only one black juror. And many people thought in a county, in a jury, so they only had 27% of black people and 25% from that pool to have only one black juror, to have the defense counsel refuse to want to allow black pastors in the courtroom. Criticism for the prosecution not raising race enough. 12 human beings recognized that a human being was hunted down and killed. Why? Because he was running. And according to that 911 call that the jurors wanted to hear, the emergency to these men was a black man running. Now, this tells you a lot about what we perceive to mean about the jury pool, what we think about the composition of jurors. But 12 human beings, 11 white, one black came to the same conclusion of what they saw. A black man hunted down on the streets of Brunswick, Georgia. Why? Simply because he existed and had the audacity to run and not stop when three white strangers told him they'd blow his head off if he didn't. So powerful, so passionate, so brilliant, Laura Coates. All right, and here is Bakari Sellers on CNN. I thought this was pretty pretty eloquent as well. We talk about the role race played in this case and the upcoming hate crime trial that these same defendants will face at a federal level. What do you think today's verdict means more broadly in that discussion? 
Well, I, I hate to push back on my colleagues today who are much more brilliant than I and probably better lawyers than I, but I don't believe today is about justice. I think Ahmaud Arbery being alive is justice. I think today is about something that's actually been even more fleeting for black people in this country in situations like this, which is accountability. Today is a day just like the Derek Chauvin trial where you finally have accountability for individuals who hunt people down and murder them um, and don't give them the benefit of their humanity. You know, <laughs> the unique thing about this is we found out today that, yeah, lynching is still illegal in the United States of America. That's what we all saw. But we also know how difficult this journey was for this family to even get to this day of accountability. We know how difficult it was to even bring charges against these individuals. And so I believe that today is the day that this country needed. I don't want to say deserved, but needed, Anna, because the fact is, just imagine if we're sitting here talking about not guilty verdicts. I believe that this country and our democracy is fundamentally fragile and hanging on by a thread. And I don't believe that a not guilty verdict today would have served us well as a country. In fact, going into this holiday weekend, I think it would have torn this country apart. That's how fragile our democracy is. And that's how tired and exhausting it is for people of color, particularly black folk in this country. So, yeah, today we had accountability. Um, I've been talking to Ben Crump and Lee Merritt all day long. Today we've had that level of accountability. But I will tell you that this is just one day and finally we got it. And tomorrow will come, and hopefully more black people won't be killed because of the color of their skin. All right, Bakari Sellers on CNN yesterday. And President Biden also put out a brief statement Wednesday reacting to the murder convictions of the three men who killed Ahmaud Arbery. He wrote, Ahmaud Arbery's killing, witnessed by the world on video, is a devastating reminder of how far we have to go in the fight for racial justice in this country. Mr. Arbery should be here today celebrating the holidays with his mother, Wanda Cooper Jones, and his father, Marcus Arbery. Nothing can bring Mr. Arbery back to his family and to his community, but the verdict ensures that those who committed this horrible crime will be punished. While the guilty verdicts reflect our justice system doing its job, that alone is not enough. Instead, we must recommit ourselves to building a future of unity and shared strength where no one fears violence because of the color of their skin. My administration will continue to do the hard work to ensure that equal justice under law is not just a phrase emblazoned in a stone above the Supreme Court, but a reality for all Americans. That is a statement from the president of the United States, Joe Biden. And we also had to hear from the former guy who had to be heard. Of course, he wanted to weigh in, of course, and get attention from this verdict and controversial case as well, though he seemed to be a a bit confused about some or all of the details in this case. So I was just headed out to my party at Mar-a-Lago where we make fun of Elizabeth Warren. That's a sort of Mar-a-Lago pre-Thanksgiving tradition. It's called patriotism and it's called Thanksgiving. But then I found out this sad result in Georgia. These three patriots, you know, they look like deliverance people. They were found guilty. And I told them, I told their lawyers, and they didn't pay attention to me, so now they're going to jail like dogs. But I said, you got to do the strong Kyle Slaughterhouse tears, the fake, you got to do the fake tears. If you're not going to do the fake tears, then they might not think you're sorry for, you know, and they, by the way, I don't think this is justice either. You know, they've been convicted of uh, killing Stefan Marbury, okay, who was a, uh, a basketball player, and I'm not too big a fan of the NBA, but even worse, this guy's even worse than LeBron. He went and played in China. He went and played in China, and they called him Starberry. So Ahmad Starberry goes to China, takes Chinese money. Okay, he's even worse than Hunter Biden. And then all of a sudden he comes back, and he's running around the neighborhood with the deliverance guys. And they say, you know, they're probably patriotic, probably voted for me. And probably not too happy with China. So they went after him uh, with a gun, okay, which is, you know, that's standard MAGA country. You know, you, when you go visit somebody on Thanksgiving, you bring them uh, an apple pie and you point an AR-15 at them. That's just sort of standard. <laughs> it's called MAGA manners, okay? It's called MAGA manners. <laughs> so they do this, and all of a sudden, uh, Stefan Marbury gets nervous, you know, like a lot of the left, 
I see a gun pointed at them, and all of a sudden they get nervous. And, you know, things happened. And, you know, I don't think this is justice. I think, you know, they should have done the fake Kevin Rittenhouse steers, <laughs> and I think they would have gotten off. Uh, but their lawyers didn't listen to me, so now they get to go to prison. And I know Mike Pence loves those prison movies, so uh, we'll see what happens. All right, Jay Alcovan, at Jay Alcovan. Go subscribe to him on YouTube. So great, by the way. I'm going to be uh, joined by him right here on this podcast next week. And let me just get to one more response. I just saw that Ellie Mistal was on TV, MSNBC, with Joy Reid, and she asked him for his top-line quick response. And was this verdict what he expected? Yes, it's what I expected, because as you said, um, it is illegal to lynch a black man in this country as long as you catch it on video. As long as you catch it on video and the dumb defendants leak that video thinking that it's going to help them and you go through one, not one, but two prosecutors and you get an all white jury, but a judge who isn't as biased as some of the judges we've seen in the recent past. Yes, it is illegal to lynch a black person in that particular set of circumstances. And this was the result I expected. I, I will put, I never, almost never disagree with you, Ellie, but we do not have an anti-lynching law in this country. So in terms of federal law, we do not have an anti-lynching law. It actually isn't federally illegal to lynch a black man in America still. Um, but you're, you're right, obviously, on the way that this case turned out on the law. And also on Joy Reid's program last night on MSNBC, she smartly talked with some indigenous folks, Washington Post reporter, Dana Hegbeth, as well as the chairman of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe, Brian Whedon, who basically talked to us and educated us that Thanksgiving Day is more of a day of mourning for a lot of indigenous folks. Here's Brian Whedon on Joy Reid's show last night. I thought this was educational, enlightening, and so I wanted to share it with you because that's what I do here. A triumph, right? A triumph of will, a triumph of the Mayflower and the Nina and the Pinta and the Santa Maria and sort of whitewash the fact that there were people here. And then to take those people and just make them, well, those were their friends and they gave them corn and then everybody did Thanksgiving. And to wipe out really what was a, a really tragic history, including for the Wampanoag of, you know, encountering European settlers getting wiped out by disease, maybe smallpox or whatever germs they were carrying, and then encountering them again, and then being colonized. How do the Wampanoag look at Thanksgiving, and, and what what would you be doing on that day? Um, I think first and foremost, it's important to understand that the Wampanoag people have always been welcoming. Uh, one of the reasons why we didn't wipe out the English was because they brought their women and children. We never brought our women and children to fight into battle. So we thought that they had come in peace. Um, it's kind of, you know, ignorant bliss on our side, I guess. Um, and we were, you know, more welcoming and, you know, taught them how to grow their corn and their crops and to stay here. Um, we've always been welcoming people and we still are welcoming people. Um, it hasn't really worked to our advantage over the past 400 years. Um, we're now witnessing uh, another pandemic here um, in the nation with COVID. Um, you know, so all the diseases that come through, we're still having diseases and these problems still mm -hmm. today. Um, I would say that, you know, Thanksgiving is a day of mourning. Um, the fact that our tribe only owns half of 1% of our ancestral territory um, and 400 years later, you know, we're still waiting for our fair share from the federal government and the Commonwealth I think is pretty unacceptable. All right. Well, I thought that was really interesting. We're going to talk a lot more about Thanksgiving Day and Thanksgiving tradition with Kenneth C. Davis in a moment. That's the chairman of the Wampanoag tribe, Brian Whedon, by the way. I should probably reach out and interview that guy myself. Super fascinating, interesting, and important. So thank you for learning along with me. And now it's time to get to... All of the rest of the headlines, rapid fire style, time for a news dump. Here's an oldie but goodie by Pete Co. Hungry piranhas swarm from a creeping clump. They're feasting on your flesh for today's news dump. All right, there you go. That was apparently inspired by listener Karen Madison, who we love as well. So let's get to it, shall we? Let's start in Sweden, where the elected their first female prime minister, and then she resigned like hours later. And I'm pretty confused about the whole thing. But Swedish first female prime minister Magdalena Andersson was forced to resign on Wednesday, less than eight hours after her appointment to position by Sweden's parliament 
I understand that this may look very messy and what has happened is completely unique. Despite the fact that parliamentary positions appear unchanged, the issue should be tried anew. I don't want to lead a government whose legitimacy might be questioned. Apparently, the resignation is technical and compulsory. compulsory. And if she will face another vote, the politician said she's ready to lead a one-party government. I don't know what the hell's happening in Sweden, but I just thought that was an interesting story because there was a, a female vice president or female prime minister for like a few hours. Seems like what happened here this past week when, or last week, when Kamala Harris took over for Joe Biden when he got a colonoscopy. By the way, the very funny joke, I forget who I saw make it, that when they did a colonoscopy on Trump when he was president, the only thing they found was uh, Lindsey Graham. So I thought that was funny. Jobless claims have plunged to just under 200,000, the lowest since 1969. New weekly claims jobless aid plunged to the lowest level in more than 50 years last week, according to data released by the Labor Department. So it's a crazy what's going on with the economy with the price of everything going up because of supply chain issues, people getting paid higher wages, and there being very few people looking for uh, aid, unemployment aid, uh, because there are a ton of jobs out there. So it's a bizarre economy and a very interesting one to pay close attention to. Also, I thought this was a good story in the wake of the horrific, tragic, awful situation in Waukesha, Wisconsin, where a man who was running away from police after apparently committing a crime uh, mowed down a bunch of people in, in a Christmas parade. Well, the NFL's J.J. Watt has offered to pay funeral costs for the parade victims. I just said a bunch of people. Uh, there were, I think, nine victims in that tragic day. The Biden administration announced it's going to require all foreign travelers crossing U.S. borders to be fully vaccinated by January 22nd. The administration previously announced that the fully vaccinated non-essential foreign travelers could enter the U.S. beginning November 8th. The White House, however, delayed the requirement for essential foreign travelers, such as truck drivers, government officials, to allow more time to get vaccinated and not disrupt trade. The Biden administration also asked the federal appeals court to reinstate its workplace rule requiring employees at larger companies to be vaccinated against COVID or to face weekly testing. The Biden administration this week also authorized the release of 50 million barrels of crude from its strategic reserves to help offset a surge in gas prices. Will it make much of a difference? It's really about, apparently, about three days worth of gas that we would uh, we use from that oil, apparently. 77% of Americans are saying inflation is personally affecting them. 35% say Joe Biden deserves the most blame for the current inflation compared to 30% who blame the disruptions on the COVID-19 pandemic. And 42% of Americans are proving the job that Joe Biden is doing as president, his lowest since taking office here on Thanksgiving. And he is spending Thanksgiving on Nantucket with his family, probably not thinking about his job approval rating. A second wind farm has been approved for the East Coast. Seven major offshore projects are included in the Biden administration plan. Federal agencies, though, gave the go-ahead Wednesday to plans to build an offshore wind farm near Rhode Island, according to CNN. The South Fork Wind Project is the second piece of the Biden administration proposal. The first commercial sale offshore wind project broke ground last week off the coast of Massachusetts. And the South Fork project was reduced from 15 to 12 turbines and tweaked and to stay out of the way of shipping lanes and, quote, high value fishing areas. Now, seven major offshore wind farms would be developed on the east and west coast and in the Gulf of Mexico under a plan announced Wednesday by the Biden administration. And that is your news dump for Thanksgiving Day, folks. So now it's time to get to. My guests, you are going to love my conversation with Joe Madison, and I hope that you'll remember to listen to it if you press stop for any reason, because it's real good. And it's get a little awkward at times with with Joe because he scolded me because I I, didn't like some of my jokes. It always goes that way with him. It's very much worth listening to. I learn a lot, as always, am inspired by Joe. But first, I've got a conversation with the great professor Kenneth C. Davis 
my favorite historian, talking about Thanksgiving, as well as some of the uh, This Week in History stuff from November. But I do have to tell you, before I get to Kenneth C. Davis, uh, about Tommy John Undergarments. Very excited to be telling you about Tommy John, because I've been hearing about it forever, but now I've got my own Tommy John underwear. And I'll tell you, when you start your day wearing Tommy John, you're that much more comfortable, so you can do everything better. Today, I both did, hosted the podcast, I did interviews, and I worked outside building a little awning on my shed in the old Tommy John's, and it was comfortable. You know why? They have a no wedgie guarantee. Seriously, every single one of Tommy John's 16 million pairs of underwear sold is covered by a no wedgie guarantee. This Black Friday, celebrate softness season by stocking up on your favorite Tommy John underwear, loungewear, and pajamas. Shop their Black Friday sale right now and give the gift of comfort comfort to everybody on your list, including yourself with Tommy John men's and women's loungewear. With over 16 million pairs sold, giving the gift of Tommy John underwear and loungewear has become a holiday tradition for families all across the country. 98% of women and men love getting a gift from Tommy John. And that's why Tommy John doesn't have customers. They have fanatics. And now you can count me as one, folks. This holiday, make everyone in your family that much more comfortable with the gift of Tommy John loungewear, underwear, and bras. And it's all backed by Tommy John's best pair you'll ever wear, or it's free guarantee. So support the show and be super comfortable during Tommy John's Black Friday sale and get 20% off site-wide plus free shipping at TommyJohn.com slash stand-up. Get 20% off plus free shipping for a limited time only at TommyJohn.com slash stand-up. Go right now. TommyJohn.com slash stand-up. Tommy John underwear feels so good. So free, so barely there. It's like going commando without the risk. You're going to love them, so go buy them now for your friends, your family, and support the show and be comfortable while you're at it. And with that said and done, it is time to bring you my interview with Kenneth C. Davis. Don'tKnowMuch.com is his website and his series of books about the Bible, Civil War, geography, history, American presence, Americans' hidden history, mythology, and more deadly than war. And his new book is Strongman, The Rise of Five Dictators and the Fall of Democracy, He's on Twitter at Kenneth C. Davis. You can hire him to teach your classroom or custom virtual visits, and we love him so much. Here we go. Thanksgiving with Kenneth C. Davis, who was wearing a pilgrim hat, too, and then he debunked it. I've got him now. There he is. Very excited to have the great Kenneth C. Davis joining me to talk about Thanksgiving and more. And I say more because I love your don't know much minute. And I realize we could probably do something like on this day in history segment every week. I'm happy to get you when I can. But since I have you on Thanksgiving week, it also corresponds with the assassination of JFK and the Nuremberg trials, both of which I found out from your Twitter feed and a great reason to follow Kenneth C. Davis on Twitter. Can you tell me anything about either or both of those before we get to Thanksgiving or will we have time? Uh, sure, I can talk to you about, about them both briefly. Uh, I mean, obviously, the JFK assassination, I think, is a pretty reasonably well-known event. Um, it has special resonance in our household because, sad to say, my wife turned 10 years old that day. And needless to say, her birthday party was canceled. Oh. Um, small, you know, a small thing in the big picture of things. But um you know, an extraordinary day in my lifetime, uh, unforgettable to all of us who lived through it. I was nine going on 10 at the time. Uh, but we, you know, we we lived every step of the way with with that event. And yet here we are all these decades later and people still are, you know, floating the conspiracy theories and looking for the other gun and all this. I write about this and don't know much about history Um at considerable length. And so I'd really send anybody there. I had posted on my Twitter account the extraordinary photograph of Lyndon B. Johnson taking the oath of office on Air Force One in Dallas uh, while Jackie Kennedy is standing next to him. And yeah. the picture doesn't show it, but she's wearing a blood spattered uh, suit as, as she's doing that. So an extraordinary moment in history. Also, 
a small bit of history. The only time uh, in history so far that the oath of office to the president was administered by a woman. She was a local judge in the Dallas area and uh, was able to administer the oath of office to uh, a shocked JFK. Um, the second LBJ. Issue, I'm sorry, a shocked LBJ. Forgive me. No, that's OK. Mm -hmm. I mean, some people think he's coming back any day now. The, in Dallas. Yeah. The second issue <laughs> is something I post annually around this time uh, and have been doing for a while. It's about the uh, Nuremberg trials opening just around this time. They opened on November 20th, but the opening statement by the U.S. prosecutor, whose name was um, Robert Jackson, uh, later a member of the Supreme Court and a very significant member of the Supreme Court, Robert Jackson was the chief uh, army of uh, chief American prosecutor in the Nuremberg trials, which, of course, were trials conducted in Nuremberg, Germany, of hundreds of former Nazi party members who were um, uh, being tried for crimes against humanity. And I always like to remind people of Robert Jackson's opening statement. Um, and if you go to the website, there's a uh, obviously a connection there to the uh, to the information about the Nuremberg trials and a day by day account of what happened there, which includes film footage of what the jurors uh, actually they weren't jurors with the judges. It was a military tribunal and witnesses and other spectators in the court were seeing. And eventually that would include. Footage from the. Uh, concentration camps and the death camps, many of these seen for the first time by most of these people and, of course, horrifying and should be uh, the final nail for anyone who still thinks that this was you know, something that's made off. Mm. Holocaust denial is something that I really struggle mightily against uh, in our lifetime. We are living in a time of increasing uh, authoritarianism, totalitarianism. I've written about this, obviously, in the recent book, Strong Man. So this is a, a, a burning issue for our time. And um, just today, another report re released saying that the United States is sliding uh, backwards from democracy. Right. Um, it is a real issue for our time. We're confronting so many issues, Pete. And I know they're serious and I like to have fun with history, hence the hat. But this is not fun. We are in the midst of this pandemic, which should not have gotten to the point of nearly 800,000 American lives being lost. It's shocking and it's appalling that this has been uh, permitted to happen. Yeah, probably we a lot more. Midst, probably a lot more lives. This ongoing racial issue uh, hi highlighted, of course, by the, the decision in a case in uh, Wisconsin last week. Um, so these are really pressing issues, on top of which then we have this complete all out assault on our democratic traditions, our democratic institutions. It did not begin on January 6th, um, but it certainly reached a peak then and is going on much more quietly and legally now in state houses and legislatures around the country as uh, Republican uh, uh, majorities in those legislatures try to gerrymand their way into control of this country for the future. Um, this is something we should all be worried about. Yes. And it's also the reason why your expertise has frankly never been more valuable. Historians right now, specifically those who have written extensively, as you have an entire your most recent book about authoritarianism, are of great value to us right now. And we talked last time also about uh, book burning and and the rewriting of history and so on. And I would only add one more detail to color what you just said in terms of Holocaust denial, which has been a thing for a long time, unfortunately. And you can almost understand when people hadn't seen videos or hadn't read about it or didn't know about a thing, but there's so much evidence uh, uh, of this historical genocide. There's nothing, of course, to debate. It's horrific. And yet we are debating, as you just mentioned, January 6th, which was only a year ago, and we watched it on TV. And so 
history is so, so important. And let's talk then about the history of Thanksgiving, because we want the real history. You always give it to us. And uh, of course, people should go to your website and, and and read your post about this, which is fantastic. And thank you for dressing as a pilgrim. But who were the pilgrims, sir? Well, that's the first thing we get to do is throw this away as the as part of the first piece of mythology. Pilgrims did not wear hats with silver buckles. What? Um, Puritans also did not wear black hats with silver buckles. And so we'll have to talk about the difference between a pilgrim and a Puritan. But let me break this down simply into a a series of uh, issues here. First of all, the pilgrims, the people we call pilgrims, there were about 102 passengers on the ship called the Mayflower, sailed out of England, arrived off the coast of Uh, Cape Cod in December of 1620. Uh, They sailed around Cape Cod and wandered around there for a bit, found some corn that they took and said, we'll come back and pay you for it later. Uh, Then they sail on and find a harbor where they are going to plant their colony. Uh, This was uh, a deserted Native American village called Patuxet. It was deserted. Uh, They found only bleached bones there because the natives there had died, died probably from an epidemic. We don't know exactly what it was, but this is why germs and disease are always important in history. Um, They died from an epidemic of a disease probably introduced by European sailors, fishermen, traders who had been in this area for a long time before the so-called pilgrims arrived. Why do I say Saul called pilgrims? Yeah, why only you... about half of the people on the Mayflower, the passengers, were what we would call pilgrims, people coming to America in search of a greater degree of religious freedom. I'll back up again here to talk about the fact that the Protestant Reformation had come to England through King Henry the Eighth when he broke from the Catholic Church and s- established the Church of England and made himself the head of the church, because the king of England is also the head of the church of England. Mm. So church and state were one in England. There were many English people, uh, like other people in Europe at the time, who felt that these reforms did not go far enough in fixing the Catholic church. This is hence the beginning of the so-called Protestant Reformation. There were people who thought, for instance, the, the Church of England was still too Catholic or too popish or too papist, as they would say. They wanted to purify it. Hence, we call them Puritans. There were other people who thought that the Church of England was uh, beyond purification. They wanted to break away from it. They were known as separatists. They go, uh, actually, they're not, uh, uh, not by choice. They are really chased out of England because, again, now the head of the church is the head of the state. And so he doesn't want people questioning his authority. They're chased for a while for 10 years to Holland, um, decide that their uh, children are growing up not as English people, but as, uh, as Dutch children and decide they want to do something else. These are the people who book passage and contract to come to America on the Mayflower. Only about half of that hundred, as I said, were those people looking for religious freedom. The other people were, uh, some were indentured servants, people who had signed on for this voyage and in exchange for the passage, they were going to work for a number of years after which they would be given a piece of property. Some of them were hired uh, 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 laborers. Some of them were a hired mercenary, like the famous John Aldrich, who um, uh, I'm 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 sorry, Miles Standish, who was kind of providing security uh, to the Mayflower Company. So they arrive in December 1620, a really lousy time to start a colony in Massachusetts. New England in December is not uh, a great place to uh, to uh, start planting crops. Um, They survive primarily by staying on the Mayflower for three months. Some of the men come ashore and they start to build a communal house. The pilgrims were a communal society at first. You could even call them 
communists because they were going to share everything together. Um, and lo and behold, sometime in March, as things are getting a little better, people are dying, by the way, during all of this. They're right. dying from exposure, uh, malnutrition, disease. This was not a, a happy few months. Uh, in March, a man in, uh, in buckskin, half-naked man, comes walking into the village and says hello to them in English and asks, asks for some beer. Um, this is the man we know as Samoset. Uh, he doesn't get the beer, but they give him some cheese and biscuits. Mm. He comes back a few days later with another man who speaks even better English. His name is Squanto. How does Squanto learn English? Well, because English captains had been sailing these waters for a long time, Squanto had been taken captive and sold into slavery by an English sea captain. He spent some time in Spain, made his way to London. Someone finds him at working in a shipyard and realizes that a Native American who speaks English could be a great asset as they plan to explore this region of the world. Wow. So Squanto makes his way back to America, and it is his village that the pilgrims have landed in, where his family and his other people have been wiped out by a plague. He indeed does ally himself with them and helps them survive the first uh, winter, helps them plant the first crops. And the following October, October of 1621, 400 years ago, uh, the pilgrims, as we call them, bring in their first harvest, their first food is collected, and they decide to celebrate this with a harvest feast. It happens in October, not November. Another thing we get very wrong. Hmm. Um, it lasted three days. You think your Thanksgiving goes on too long? They, they did it for three days. 90 of the warriors of the Wampanoag uh, people who had become somewhat allied with these uh, pilgrims and were working together in an uneasy alliance show up for this meal. They are very good guests. They go out and bring home, uh, bring back in five deer. So there was venison. There was a lot of seafood. There was turkey, duck, and geese, but all wild, not the turkey we think of today. There was a lot of seafood, uh, cod, mussels, eel. I don't know if eel will be on your table to not, tomorrow. It's not on mine. Um, and certainly venison. Uh, and as I said, they, this lasted for three days. And uh, Ken, could, were... you just, could you just say it again? I'm not going to edit it. It'll just be funny. But we're, I'm posting this on Thanksgiving. So you have to say, I don't know if eel's going to be on your Thanksgiving table today. Okay. <laughs> you don't so have let's to talk anymore. About, let's talk about that first meal. What yeah. did they eat? Uh, there was no turkey as we know it, although there was turkey, duck, and geese of the wild variety. But these people were also uh, living on the shores of an Atlantic Ocean teeming with, uh, with fish. So there was cod, mussels, mm. eel. I don't know if you'll have eel on the menu today. It's not a, uh, on our table, but um, it would be entirely historically appropriate. Um, and then the, the things that they had brought in that were the typical uh, uh, crops of the native people. The three sisters in particular, corn, squash, and beans. These are three, uh, three foods that are grown together throughout uh, the North American uh, indigenous world and were really the principal food uh, source in addition to you know, hunting uh, wild game. Wasn't it you so, who told me that tomatoes did not come till much later, I feel like? Well, I think I what I told you is that tomatoes were native to the Americas and made their way back to Italy after Columbus's arrival. Right, that's what you told so me. The right. essential ingredient that most people think of in Italian food, certainly in certain regions, um, didn't exist before Columbus uh, sailed to the Americas and brought the tomato. Uh, pomodoro in, in, in Italian, uh, which is a version of apple of gold. Um, uh, he brought those back to, um, to Italy. Um, 
So, yeah, that's part of the exchange that this extraordinary era of exploration, discovery, colonization, and then ultimately of destruction begins uh, in this uh, period a little over 400 years ago. So what else do we need to know about anything else about the menu or the tradition in terms of the meal uh, and, you know, it lasting three days? Or can we move on to ask you about what the Civil War has to do with Thanksgiving? Well, let me just clarify one point, other okay. point here. This wasn't, you know, there they weren't the first to do this. Um, having a harvest festival, a Thanksgiving feast is a very ancient tradition practiced in many civilizations, many communities. Certainly other Europeans in America would have had such a feast, both in the Spanish colonies, which existed for a long time, as well as in the British colony uh, in Virginia. Uh, where they uh, date uh, a Thanksgiving feast too, too much earlier. So this this wasn't novel, but this is the one that got planted in the American imagination because they kind of won the history wars of, about who gets to tell this story. So it became part of our foundation legend. Wars, yeah. And that's why the Civil War plays into this. For about 30 years, a woman named Sarah Josepha Hale had uh, she was a magazine editor. I guess we could call her the sort of the Martha Stewart of 19th century America. She wrote for a magazine that was like the good housekeeping of its day. And she really was pestering presidents for a long time to create a holiday around Thanksgiving and around this tradition. There had been Thanksgiving days before. George Washington proclaimed one for the Constitution, James Madison proclaimed one at the end of the War of 1812. Thanksgiving days that had nothing to do with the, the Puritan pilgrim myth. In 1863, in the midst of the Civil War, perhaps in one of the most uh, unhappy moments in the Civil War, when the war was still going on, Gettysburg had happened a few months before, tens of thousands of Americans dying on both sides. Abraham Lincoln indeed agrees to Sarah, to Sarah Josepha Hale's idea and proclaims a day of Thanksgiving on the last Thursday in November of 1863. This is the first presidential proclamation that kind of sets this date where it is today and would continue on from, from Lincoln. Lincoln's proclamation, though, still doesn't mention pilgrims, Mayflower, uh, happy meals, and all that. It's really the tradition that was added on later. Lincoln was really just saying, we need a day to, to humbly thank for all the good things we have, even in the midst of this terrible war. And it's quite striking to read his words. He repeats it a, 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 a year later in 1864, and talks about that we should be humble and really get on our knees and ask for forgiveness as well as thanksgiving. A very, very different idea from what we think about when we sit down to this uh, enormous uh, feast. Um, so I think it's interesting that this moment comes. And Lincoln, I think, was also trying to say this is about something that brings us together as Americans. We have more in common than we have differences I think that was his hope to, to some degree. Of course, it was a, a mostly vain hope. But it's mm. from there that we get this then continuing policy. It becomes a federal holiday, which means a day off for federal workers in around 1870, right. and then eventually becomes a true national holiday. It had been statewide in many places until after the Civil War. Um, so uh, the last bit of this that's kind of interesting, besides the little bit of trivia that Sarah Josepha Hale is also famous for having written a poem called Mary Has a Little Lamb. Oh, um, yes. Yeah, so we should know this woman, but uh, most she's obscure to most of us. The most interesting next piece, I think, of the Thanksgiving story as it's celebrated uh, is in 1939. Franklin D. Roosevelt is president. The Depression is still going on. It had been going on for uh, the previous 10 years um, since the Great Crash in 1929. Roosevelt has 
continued to make the Thanksgiving proclamations, as all other presidents have done. In 1939, there are five Thursdays in November. Hmm. So the last Thursday would have been the fifth Thursday. Retailers came to him and said, please, Mr. President, move it up a week so we can still start the holiday shopping season because Thanksgiving, even then, had begun the holiday shopping season. Macy's Day Parade had started in 1924, beginning that uh, uh, tradition. So uh, 24 or 26, I'm sorry. So Roosevelt agrees to move Thanksgiving up a week to the fourth Thursday. Wait, so wait, Macy, the Macy's Day Parade was kind of uh, launched to bring attention to this is the, the time to start shopping at Macy's and, and uh, for Christmas. Is that what that was? The It was a promotional. I never it really cer- put that. It together. was certainly promotional in the begin in, in uh, from the outset. It was certainly seen as, a, a, you know, it was already a holiday, uh, a, a national holiday to yeah. some degree. Uh, it was also, uh, interestingly, and we can talk about uh, this is another aspect of Thanksgiving, I think is interesting. It was a very important holiday for American immigrants. And a lot of European immigrants worked at Macy's and they were accustomed to the idea of a harvest festival with a parade through the village celebrating the harvest, which is what we're essentially doing. So the idea of giving their employees a day off and the employees would then march in this parade was actually, and that's what it was in the beginning, Macy's employees were the ones who were doing most of the marching. So it does have that roots, but from the very beginning, yes, because it's still at the end of the parade, who comes down the road on Fifth Avenue and Broadway, but but Santa Claus. So it was always seen as an initiation into the holiday shopping season. When 1939 comes around and Thanksgiving is pushed back a week, the retailers were nervous. They were still coming out of the depression. They wanted to get it started sooner. Right. And so Roosevelt agrees, sets Thanksgiving proclamation that year as uh, the fourth Thursday. Uh, Congress Republicans in Congress scream at this. You're trampling on tradition. Abraham Lincoln made it the last Thursday. You can't do this. So in 1939, there are two Thanksgivings, a Republican and a Democratic oh, Thanksgiving. Goodness. We can truly fight over anything in this country. And we have. Um, it's, you know, laughingly, I'm saying this, but this notion of partisanship is really, you know, very, very deep. Right. Um, The Republicans actually even called the Roosevelt date, the earlier date, Franksgiving for Franklin D. Roosevelt. And in lots of states, then the governors said, no, this day or that date. Two years later, Congress decides in a moment of bipartisanship, let's figure this out and settle it. They established Thanksgiving as a national holiday on the fourth Thursday in November, which is where it is today which is why we have the day off and we're all sitting down to this feast together. The Canadians, by the way, do their Thanksgiving in October, which would be historically more appropriate. Historically more appropriate in terms of when the actual feast occurred, because that otherwise a lot of the the harvest that they eat, a lot of the menu items, they, they, they might not have been good. I mean, I don't know how they preserve things but they wouldn't have been as delicious in November as they would have been in October is, that's, is what my garden true. You know, if you, if you, if you pick your squash, uh, you know, squ- these are all, you know, kind of root vegetables. Yeah. yeah. So they last a, a little bit longer, but your corn, you know, unless you've turned it into corn meal, uh, to make uh, cornbread stuffing, I suppose. I don't know. Um, yeah, that, that it makes more sense to do it in October, but this is the, as the tradition emerged. Uh, in in uh, in America. And the Civil War part of it really kind of cemented this because this was the year in 1864 that a group of men in New York, largely men, I'm sure women helped, probably did all the cooking, prepared Thanksgiving meals to be transported to Petersburg, Virginia, where General Grant had his troops surrounding the city of Petersburg starving them to death, by the way, uh, in the siege of Petersburg. And so the troops 
got Thanksgiving dinner in 1864 delivered to them by a, a group called the Union League, a uh, group primarily of wealthy Republican uh, uh, supporters of Lincoln, supporters of the Union, very powerful group in its day. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt's father was a member of the Union League and one of the principal movers in this um, Thanksgiving meal. And they sent shiploads of uh, turkey, pies, mince pies, and all the trimmings down to the troops in uh, Virginia, which at that time was the, the busiest port in the world uh, because so many ships were coming in, bringing in uh, 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 ammunition supplies to the troops in, in uh, Petersburg. And this is, of course, months before the Civil War finally comes to an end. Wow. So much. There's so much we could talk about. So many other things that occurred, uh, disputes over history during that time. But there's such a rich history. You're such an amazing, you're like your computer, Kenneth C. Davis. You, just, you could just talk about this stuff right at, at your fingertips. I love it. I love every single ounce of it. Really fascinating. Well, is there anything it's, else? It's, do I have to let you go? Because I want more. I, I, I do have to go. Uh, I, I have know. to go cook dinner, in fact. Well, what so, are you, um, let me just ask you then. What is it that you, is there a traditional thing uh, part of the the feast that you menu item that you least like? Are you a squash person? Uh, my mom and my wife love squash, but and my brother, but the rest of us not so much. I don't like or uh, care is the only orange ish thing mm. I like. But I do like squash. Do. I like different kinds of squash. In fact, um, my tie looks very much like what is called a delicata squash, hmm. which is um, you see it in the uh, the supermarkets these days. It's a long. Uh, 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 a long, thinnish uh, squash, um, but it has yellow and bluish stripes, and you can cook that with the skin on, mm. and it's really delicious. Is there anything you don't so, so you eat everything? That's why you love going to Italy and traveling. Is there anything you don't like? Um, yeah, there are a lot of things I don't like. I mean, I I, I don't do anything with the gizzards, for instance. You know, <laughs> I, that's. All right. Fair enough. We leave that out of the picture. <laughs> Got um, it. OK. No, I, and, and I have to say our uh, especially this year, because, you know, families are not gathering. I, I hope everyone's having a lovely gathering. I hope you're still being really careful while you're gathering. Um, we are still in the midst of, you know, some very, very sketchy times with yeah. this um, pandemic. So please, you know, if you're seeing this before you get together, be careful. Um, yep. if everyone's not vaccinated, you, you really have to be careful. That's what everyone is telling us. No doubt about um, it. Couldn't agree so, more. um, I, we, we are, th this year is a little bit trimmed down. We'll do the Turkey and we'll do roast potatoes and roast vegetables and probably mashed potatoes. Um, I prefer, um, a, an apple crisp to a pumpkin pie. It's not that I don't like pumpkin pie. It's just that an uh, apple crisp is easier. And I we think do both. More delicious, I do. So. I, I usually my mom usually makes both. And I usually I, I can visualize a plate with a slice of, of each. And when I say a plate, I mean like four plates because I, I keep going back at it. So that's my favorite part. The pie. But I think that I think that pies can be very noble. How so, so how uh, so? Oh, right. Well, Yes, I'm sure. I'm sure you've had a noble pie in your day. I certainly so, have. I certainly have. And now, uh, noble pies else. has a new location, which you forced me to plug. Noble pies in Westchester, New York, too. Very exciting. Okay, well, Kenneth C. Davis, happy Thanksgiving. Thank you for joining us and educating us. Uh, I'm very grateful for all of the lessons that you've given us this year and all the years previous. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Pete. I'm always grateful for the opportunity uh, and I'm grateful for our friendship and our long uh, association talking yes, about this. Um, these are human stories. They're really fascinating stories. I think the truth is so much more interesting than the hokey uh, pageant that we tell the kids that um, it's, it's really fascinating to know this stuff. And uh, my books are really just a way to get into learning much more about it. So uh, enjoy your holiday, enjoy your family, and um, best wishes to everyone. And um, we have a lot to be thankful for. Yes. Thanks a lot, Pete. Thank you, sir. 
All right, there he goes, Kenneth C. Davis. So great, always great to talk with him. A very special Thanksgiving conversation. And you should follow him on Twitter at Kenneth C. Davis and go get all his books. Don't know, don't know much.com. Great gifts for all of your loved ones. Uh, seriously, I love all of his books. I love his writing. I've learned so much. I'm not just saying that, obviously. I love Kenneth C. Davis. And now it's time to bring a very special guest on the show for the first time. He is the host of the Joe Madison Show on Sirius XM every weekday from 6 to 10 a.m. East. And right now he is on day 17 of a hunger strike until there is action on voting rights. He's going to continue right through Thanksgiving. And Joe is a legend, let me just say. He is a legend in civil and human rights. He has won all kinds of awards, most recently a Lifetime Civil Rights Advocate Award from the Alabama NAACP. He's been inducted into the National Black Radio Hall of Fame. He holds the Guinness Book of World Records for longest broadcast. He's done amazing work as a recognized human and civil rights activist, demanding action against injustice every weekday morning on his SiriusXM show. And I just always had a great relationship with Joe. But in this interview, it gets a little uh, awkward at one point. Joe doesn't always get my jokes, doesn't always understand the point I'm making, and... He, he jumps in and, you know, it's on Zoom, but it after it gets awkward, it gets better again. But I made a joke I shouldn't have made about his hunger strike, and he scolded me for it, as he always does, and I love him for it, all of it. And then we turned around, and it, it was great. It's totally worth listening to every minute of it, and I so appreciate Joe Madison for being my friend and look forward to talking to him again soon. But I think without further ado, let's get to it right now. Here we go. Joe Madison. And thank you, Tina Winsett, for giving me the heads up about Joe and his hunger strike, by the way. I I don't even I didn't know about it until Tina told me. So such great listeners, such valuable suggestions, recommendations each and every day. Here we go. And I have the legend with me right now. It has been way too long since I've spoken with my old friend and mentor and a man who I look up to a great deal. It's such an honor to, to have him on the podcast. Joe Madison joining me, sir. You, you look good for a man who has not eaten in how long? What is today? I think day 16. Yeah, day 16. And, you know, they're, they're good days, bad days. Uh, and, but nothing that I didn't anticipate would be would going on. I don't know what people expected me to uh, look like, but I'm just hoping that uh, when you know that I won't have to go through this uh, much longer. But it won't be up to me. Uh, it'll be up to the United States Senate. Right. Well, that's where the problem lies. I'm sorry. I'm I'm told day 17. It's day 17. One One of the things that you, when you're going on a hunger strike or fasting and people, you know, tend to intertwine the two is, you know, they, they, they expect you to, one of the things you shouldn't do is, is count how many days it is because you don't put a time limit on this kind of protest. And the other thing that you, I've been taught by Dick Gregory, I've learned this a long time ago, in addition to you don't count the number of days because you it could be weeks, it could be months. You, you just don't know. You also don't weigh yourself. You know, people think, oh, you, you know, but you don't because it's not about weight loss. It's a, it's a protest. So, when did you decide to do this? Why did you decide to do this? And how do you or why do you think it will be effective? Well, I, I decided after I realized that the issue of voting rights protection and the involving at least three things, one, the filibuster, should it continue, should it not continue, two, the uh, Freedom to Vote Act, And the second bill was the John R. Lewis Voter Advancement Act. And I was extremely upset with the fact that the Republican senators would uh, not support any of the three. 
I was upset with the fact that President Biden kept seemed to keep pushing these these voting protection bills to the uh, back burner. Now I understood politically why because he he had the infrastructure bills that he wanted to pass. But you know the the reality is that Democrats are going to have to learn you know the old game patting your head and rubbing your stomach at the same time they they they're going to, have to they they have to learn that that this issue is is as important as the infrastructure because as I and Biden kept pulling around debating about the filibuster should I or should not and then there were there have been a series of protests people for the american way they weren't getting as much attention as they should have there had been three or four arrests even martin luther king the 3rd got arrested in front of the white house right. very little attention very little attention and and then um, you know our friend with national action network al sharpton he had a major protest on the capitol a rally you had Melanie Campbell, who heads up a coalition of civil rights. They got very little attention. You even had the chairwoman of the Congressional Black Caucus, Joyce Beatty, who, along with other members of the Congressional Black Caucus, uh, got arrested on Capitol Hill while the Senate was uh, debating or, or not debating about the voting protection bills, very little attention. So I began thinking, it looks like somebody has got to do something that might appear extreme. And, uh, and people are saying, well, this is extreme. Well, my answer to that is no, what the United States Senate is doing or not doing is extreme. And that was the first thing I thought about. Then I started dealing with history. Yeah. And I look back at what happened in 1877 when they uh, when white former plantation owners, former Confederates, elected officials cut a deal with Rutherford B. Hayes to withdraw the troops from the South because their whole world had been turned upside down. You know, imagine that, man, you within Five, six years, seven years, former slaves, your former slaves, not yours, but I mean former slaves, were, were now members of Congress, were now in the Senate, were now in the House of Representatives, ran state legislatures, you know, were, and, and, and so they cut a deal to remove the federal troops. Well, once the federal troops were removed from the former Confederate states, all hell broke loose. They started assassinating black elected officials. The Ku Klux Klan was born. And, you know, rifle clubs were formed in South Carolina. And, you know, I just conflated what was going on then to today, fast forwarding. And we often refer to it as this being the second reconstruction. Yeah. And, and lo and behold, after. Donald Trump lost the presidency after the Supreme Court ripped out the heart of the Voting Rights Act. What happened? Uh, they went after our votes. And so you have 400 bills that have been introduced in 49 states to suppress the vote. And I just look, I just said, OK. And I thought about my friend, my mentor, Dick Gregory. And I, I started thinking, what would he do? And um, I had a long conversation with one of his sons, Christian Gregory, and we talked about how the pressure had to be increased. There had to be tension, what Dr. King called creative tension. And that's when I decided to do to go on this hunger strike and refer to it as starving for uh, the vote. Yeah. And so my position was very simple, that I would not eat any solid food. And, and until one of these bills were passed, and my, my position was simple, just as food 
is essential, is, ne- is a necessity for, for life, the vote is essential and a necessity to, con- to continue our dem- to protect our democracy. That's how the, that's how the, the decision uh, came about and consulting with doctors and, you know, and of course, you had to get permission from Sherry, my wife, who was very concerned, as rightfully she, she should have been. But I just, I just felt that there was no way that I was going to have historians write about this, this situation we're in today and have my children ask, well, what did you do about it? And And that's why I made the decision. Your last part of the question is, do I think it it will work? I I said it this morning on my show, I mean, on Thanksgiving Eve, Wednesday, that when you enter into a protest like this, you step out on faith. That's the answer to that last part of your question. I don't know. It's not up to me. It's up to the United States Senate. You step out on faith. Have you, I mean, you're going to you're going to go Thanksgiving, Joe, without eating. Look, there, y- yes. And your point. My point is, can we get well, you? See, look, 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 let me, let me be, you know, you and I are always very candid with each other. <laughs> there, so I knew that when this happened, because I knew the United States Senate wasn't going to move before their uh, Thanksgiving recess. When I think about what people sacrificed after the end of the first reconstruction are you kidding me when i think about goodman swarner and cheney who were killed because they were students who went to mississippi to register people to vote when when i think about john lewis who damn near died at the foot of the edmund pettus bridge when i think of of pastors and 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 other people who maybe their church was burned down and they were lynched, you know, m- missing a meal is, is really not a major sacrifice. Well, I, 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 uh, I understand, but the, the issue here, as you know, is not about what you think or what black folks think in America. The issue here is Dr. King and so many others have, have pointed to it's what is it? The, uh, the white moderates, uh, specifically liberals. And so, I appreciate what you're doing, but my vote is not threatened. My 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 daughters are, are not. Let and so interrupt. I'm going to I'm going to just let, let hold on. Let me interrupt. See, this is why I'm important to you. Your vote is threat. No, listen, listen very carefully. I know, I know. Your, your vote, your vote is threatened by these 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 uh, voter suppression. Now, and let me give you an example. Uh, and, uh, first of all, your districts may be gerrymandered, number one. And there have been re- white Republicans who are not supporters of Trump, whose district has been gerrymandered to the point they can't run or are not, unable to run or can't afford to run. Number two, I've had I've had uh, disabled veterans who have contacted me. Uh, Black and white, by the way, who have said in, in my state, they've introduced a, 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 a law where and where if I'm a disabled veteran and I want to drive up to a polling place and have the poll worker bring out the ballot so I can I don't have to wheelchair in. Um, they have voted. They have passed ordinance or trying to pass a law that says I can't do that. If I'm a, if, if in Wisconsin just recently, they they actually tried to arrest white poll workers, Republican poll workers who were working with senior citizen nursing homes to during the pandemic to bring ballots to them so they could mail them in. And these these law, the law that was introduced in Wisconsin you know, uh, uh, prevented it, and they did what? They 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 talking about now throwing these poll workers in jail, and so so the reality is, it not only fo- it's not only you know I know it may have been initiated in part because of black folks in 
Arizona, Hispanics, um, and Black people in Georgia that turned the state from ruby red to sky blue. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I, I left out the students. Laws that say, well, it, in some states, you can use a hunting license uh, to, uh, to, be, to register to vote as identification, but you can't use your student ID. So, so what I'm saying is, what, you, what you're saying is that it has unintended effects. These voter suppression laws have unintended effects on folks, a, a whole bunch of folks that might actually vote Republican. But if I were to finish my point, it was this. White people have to care. White, the white moderate, the white liberal has to care. You can do all the activism you want. But if white folks in the suburbs like me don't move and don't vote and don't care about this issue, then we don't or any of these issues regarding civil rights, then it's far more difficult to create change. So I want to make sure folks don't think they are off the hook because they don't think that it affects them. They don't think that it's about their vote or the issues that we care about. It, it, it's I'm not affected. This is black folks. It's their vote. I don't have to worry about it. And I have to worry about these other issues. But the point is, it's not the conservative, the people who are behind it. Uh, we can deal with them. It's the white liberal, the white moderate. And that's what I'm hearing a lot of civil rights leaders saying for generations. What do you think about that? What I think about that is they ought to study their history and realize, my God, I just got this thing. You remember Goodman, Schwerner, and Cheney? They were yep. two white kids and one black kid. Excuse me. When they went to in, at the, go back to the first Reconstruction, well, they didn't just lynch black people, but they lynched uh, uh, our allies, our white allies. Um, I am I am saying to you uh, that what you're saying may be true. Then they ought to study their history. Uh, they and 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 they ought to w- watch and listen to this podcast. Because you're now educating them as to why they need to understand they're in this just as deep as we are. Yeah. This is, matter of fact, this whole thing should be bipartisan. Uh, 2007, when G.W. Bush was the president of the United States, he signed a year early the, the Voting Rights the night he, he extended the Voting Rights Act. Now, folks may not know this, but let me tell you something else they probably don't remember. Ninety eight senators voted to extend the Voting Rights Act of 1965 in 2007. Now, here's the real question. Where did those Republicans go? Why is it that today we can't find, and this is the challenge, at least 10 moderate Republicans? Who, by the way, when when these draconian walls uh, get voted on are in place, then they're going to have if they don't realize what I'm doing now and what we're protesting for now, they're going to find out the hard way right. come next uh, this time next year. So you're talking about uh, going back to history with with Bush uh, extending the Voting Rights Act reauthorization with all of the Republican senators. The thing that changed, as you know, is the judicial branch weighed in on something that the legislative branch was unanimous on Republicans and Democrats and a Republican president. The judicial branch, uh, the Supreme Court, led by John Roberts, said, listen, we these states are are good. They will behave. We no longer need the hallmark signature legislation of the civil rights movement and Dr. King and that movement. We don't need that anymore because these states are they're better. They're going to behave. And they got rid of it. And then what happened, Joe? <laughs> well, I'll tell you well, I'll tell you exactly what happened. Because you only you left out part two. Okay. And part two was that John Roberts said, I may be right. I may be wrong, so I'm going to give it back to Congress to, in essence, override if you don't like my decision. Right. And John Lewis, that's when John Lewis then helped to write what is now the John Lewis 
uh, uh, voting advancement bill. That's the other part. And that's exactly what he did. So if you're going to tell the story, then tell the whole story, because that's exactly what happened. And then, of course, as you know, what also happened immediately after John Roberts' uh, a, a decision is states immediately started introducing these voter suppression laws. Uh, so, so, you know, that's the complete story. And this went, and then you also remember John Lewis led a demonstration which included uh, on the floor. He actually had a sit in on the floor of the House of, of Representatives. Uh, so that's the 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 uh, the the whole uh, the whole story. So let me and, ask and this you. has to be this has to be. I mean, this is truly bipartisan. And I, I mean, and, and, and oh, here's what I was going to say to you. The other thing you left out. I'll tell you what really happened in two words. Donald Trump. And let's quit bullshit. It was Donald Trump. That's what happened. And Donald Trump was able to grasp these, the attitude of, of, of these white, suburban, middle class voters. And, 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 uh, and, and we have had to deal with it uh, ever since. My question is, where are the white, where are the white moderate republics? Uh, where are uh, the, the the students? Uh, you know, where are uh, the 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 individuals? Uh, and 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 that's why my actions, I think, have grasped their attention. Good. Well, at this point in your your life and your career, you have been honored for your work as a broadcaster, as well as an activist. You always walk the walk while the rest of us just stay in our sheds and talk the talk. And so my, my specific question is, are you surprised that we are where we are at when it comes specifically to voting rights? You have been fighting for all kinds of civil rights in this country, but also human rights in other countries like Sudan. I mean, now you are sitting here on a on a on starving on a protest for voting rights in America in 2021, and I'm guessing you did not have that on your bingo card at this point in your life and career. But maybe you're not surprised at all. I don't know, Joe. How do you feel well, about where well, we're at? Well, let me throw this back at you, since we both are in this business. Are you surprised? I am. Okay, I'm not surprised. I'm disappointed. I'm pissed off. I'm not surprised. Right. I've been around long enough and seen enough not to be surprised at anything. Right. And 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 but but I am pissed off. I'm disappointed. And as I've said before, and I will challenge you, but you're you're you you've accepted the challenge because we're doing this 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 we're having this discussion. Everybody can do something. People have got to get engaged. Everybody can do something. Look, I don't expect folks to, and I've got people, man. I got a 74, who was it? A 74-year-old white woman who emailed me the other day and said, um, she she reminded me, she said, I fasted uh, for 40 days. Now get this, for House Bill 40. What was House Bill 40? HB 40. To study, to study reparations. Oh. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. A 73-year-old white woman said, I want to tell you, I'm with you. I fasted for 40 days for House Bill 40, which was to study reparations. And for 40 days, water, uh, juice, and what did she say? Bone broth. And I'm saying to you, my God, everybody can do something. Most people don't do anything. And that's why we're in the predicament 
we're in. And I'm going to add something else, if you don't mind, this, this about this um, getting this passed. The count, first of all, the calendar is our enemy. It, it, it's really the enemy because yeah. I don't know what's going to happen if they don't put this on the agenda and vote on it uh, during the, the, the next month of December. Because they're going to go on their Christmas recess. And after that, I, all bets are off. Number two, um, I, I, I interviewed uh, the National Intelligence, retired intelligence director, uh, retired Lieutenant General uh, Clapper. And he surprised me. Now, this is, this is interesting because this goes back to the point you made about should white America be concerned? You know what he said to my audience? That, that our enemies, our, our adversaries, primarily Russia and China, are hoping like hell that these bills don't pass because it could spell the end of democracy. So that involves all of us, even those folks are sitting in a shed. Well, I couldn't agree more with that. And the question is, you know, what are you doing? And and for uh, white folks in the suburbs, especially, I want to ask you a question, though, about uh, racism in America today, because the way I see it. Calling people racist, calling things racist, we can we can talk about what works in communication, what convinces people and so on. But, Joe, what I've been trying to my thought process, my opinion is, listen. Let's forget about how you feel about black folks individually, the one you work with, uh, the famous people, whatever. Let's forget about what you think about racial injustice and where this country is at. Bottom line is this. If you don't support the right for everybody to vote, if you don't support the Voting Rights Act, which Dr. King passed, which has been repealed, if you don't support restoring that, then that's the most racist thing you could do. You can call someone a racist name. You can even create a policy that minimizes or marginalizes opportunity for black and brown folks. Those are terrible things. But the worst thing you can do is make it harder for people to vote. That's the most racist thing you can do. Do you agree with the way that I am wording that, the semantics, the, the, the way that I'm, I, I'm looking and labeling that? No. Okay. Well, this got awkward. <laughs> got awkward. Got and, awkward. And let's start. Well, not, let's start at the. It's not. First of all, it's not the worst. Uh, it, it's probably the most unpatriotic. You know. No, I'll tell you what. The I mean, worst short thing, of. No, well, let me finish, man. The worst thing. Look, you know. Listen, man. The worst thing that you can do is lynch somebody. Well, come because, on. Well, excuse me. What's worse than lynching somebody? No, no, no nothing. I, I mean, I'm talking about in a conversation. About I'm having a conversation yeah. and I'm responding to you. First okay, of all, I let me you ask my opinion and I'm going to give it to you. Yeah. And let me start the way you first started off. Oh, you can. What was it? How you started? You started with, oh, you know, let's 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 the race. Let's put the race thing aside. Excuse me. You can do that. You know, don't tell me to do it when or my son to do it when because of the color of his skin. He's got to look behind him to see if some blue light may be uh, 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 following him. I mean, the list goes on and on. But then when but I'm responding to I, I know what you're trying to say. You're just not saying it well. Uh, and, and no, I mean that. And, and, here, and what, because, listen, what you, when you're talking to me and anybody else and you say and I know what you're trying to say. Don't ever say that the worst thing that could happen is keeping somebody from their right to vote. No, the worst there, the worst thing that could happen is lynching somebody because they tried to vote. The worst thing that could happen is ignoring the truth and the history of this country. The worst thing could happen is burning down a church. That's the worst thing that could happen. Now, let's take a step up. Yes, then denying people the right to vote uh, is, is, is right there in the top of the list. I would agree with that. Well, I appreciate you 
reframing it and giving more perspective. Uh, of course, that is that is true. And uh, you mentioned ignoring truth in history. So I, I definitely wanted to ask you about that. You got a few more minutes. My time with you is up, according to what I'm I asked. Always, I'm, I'm okay. Yeah, let's do a few more minutes. Okay. Okay. Yeah, well, sure. No problem. Okay. So it's not like you got to take a break to eat or anything. Right. I'm just, I'm just. I being, know. I, it's the comedian you. I am. Is, she, <laughs> mad, is she mad at me? Yes, but that's okay. The, 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 I, I look, I, look I'm, I know you, you know me, and, and I understand. The uh, idea, the but idea. I, the, but, the, I, but, I, but I say, I say to you, I, and I say this with all sincerity. Sometimes we got to put the jokes aside. The idea, no, and, you know, it, don't get offended. I'm not Damn offended, it, man. It, look, sometimes you you have to put the jokes aside because I, because 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 this is because I'm going to tell you some of the in other countries, Soviet Union, I mean Russia, China, they lynch your ass for telling the kind of jokes you tell, and 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 this and and, and I'm not. And again, this is not criticism. This is this is observation. This is real. I mean, I'm going to tell you, man, what we saw happen on January 6th wasn't anything funny about that. And I know comedians, you know, I know you guys get paid to make jokes and I laugh at them just like you do. And you're a great comedian. You really are. But when 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 but I, I I'm not doing an. I'm doing this, this, having this discussion with you because I admire you, I trust you, and I respect you. Um, and, um, uh, and I think you have an audience that really needs to understand that um, we could end up with this thing we call democracy totally destroyed. I, I fully agree. And I, I, yeah. you and I go way back, and I just want to say, Part of what we do is I say ignorant, undignified remark and you, and you put me in my place. So to pull back okay. the curtain so nobody thinks I'm offended or that it's awkward, I play the role, a role in our conversations with you. And the role that you play is the elder. That's how it works now. Well, the role. <laughs> well, don't do that to young people. They're not ignorant. <laughs> not, yes, yes, they are. And let me, and, 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 let, me, and, and let me also let me also tell you, <laughs> the elder. <laughs> I wish I wish there were more elderly people, quote unquote, that would speak up and and do something. This is but this is where we all are going to have to link arms. I, and and uh, and 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 you and I know you understand. Elder, elder you is understand. elder is a uh, compliment and means wiser in the case between <laughs> yeah. you and I right now. I didn't say anything about elderly. Uh, if I am, if, yes, and I was, uh, no, I said, <laughs> I, I said, elder. You are the <laughs> elder in the. And I will say yeah, this. Okay. I'll give you one more caveat. I'm going. I, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to get my. I'm going to get my. Uh, uh, my uh, younger daughter <laughs> to, to 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 talk to you and say he sounds elderly. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> no, listen, I will I will interview your younger daughter hey, minute, ab about look, you. Look, look, wait a minute, wait a minute. Look, look who's calling somebody elderly with all that gray in his beard. Hey, <laughs> I did. Listen, I want to be clear. I did not add the why. I said elder, and furthermore, I, know you I will did. give you this. Okay. I will give you this. What's if that? whatever, I don't know how old you are, but I know you are actually older than I'm, me. And if I'm, I am, if I am in as good, I'm, I'm, physical, I'm seventy. I'm seventy two years. Okay, so young. <laughs> I do not think I will make it to your age. I and, hope you do. And, but if I do, if I do, and I'm in half as good a shape and half as good looking as you, I will be sat more than satisfied. <laughs> now, moving okay. on. Enough. Enough. <laughs> moving on. I have to get your take. On this issue that I and many others are fighting in my community. My, Joe, my community has uh, absolutely lost it. We are typical of what you're seeing in the news with these Board of Education and all this nonsense and the CRT. And I just as, as we wrap up here, I got to get your take, your rant on what you see happening and what I am supposed to do. 
We're organizing a whole bunch of families. We're speaking out. We're doing, I think, what, what everything that we should do right. But we are in. We are in for the fight. I am ready for it. I'm using every skill and resource I have to to fight with these folks in my community, my neighbors. They are terrified of their white children learning history and finding out all kinds of things about America's past. They are terrified about uh, the way their kids then then feel. And this is what I said, and I'll, I'll shut up. I said, if your kid feels bad about their about being white after something they learned in school, that's a parenting issue, not a school issue. Nonetheless, I got to. How do you see this movement and this fight at, at at local at the local level? Well, in all politics is local. Um, and, and you're 100 percent right. First of all, you're doing let's go back. You're doing the right thing. You're organizing. You're fighting back. Number two, the second part of your of your concern is. History has to be taught factually. Uh, there's someone told me about this old African proverb that. Uh, as long as the lion writes the history, the lion will always win. Mm. Um, the, 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 the reality is, is it, it is just amazing that you're, in other words, be concerned about everybody's sensitivity when it comes to telling history. Tell the whole truth. And this and where and this is again, it's, it's a combination of teaching and parenting. When when if every civilization of, of human of, of mankind, humankind, every civilization has good and evil. Every civilization, you tell the history, and it is not to have your child feel. Badly, it's to it's to look forward. It's to look forward. Uh, I don't think children of the South <laughs> should feel badly about the fact that their great 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 grandfather, whose monuments are built to them, uh, you know, should feel badly that they grew up in Mississippi or Georgia. The lesson of history is that which is bad, that which destroyed, should be a lesson not to repeat it. You know what's so crazy about this? My God, we, we teach about World War II and Hitler. Nobody has ever stood up in a, in a board meeting and said, you know, I really don't want people to teach about uh, what Hitler did to Germany and World War uh, Mussolini. Hello there. Uh, you know, look, you're, Ita you're Italian, right? You're Italian descent, right? Do you feel bad about being a, 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 an ancestor of, uh, of an Italian dictator? Has your parents, you know, come on, has your parents, did your parents ever go to a board meeting and say, well, you know what? Uh, let's not teach them about Mussolini because we Italians, you know, we don't want we don't want well, poor little. We, oh, no, come on now. We well, I, I mean, I, I, you, you're putting me on the uh, spot. You're putting me on the spot and forcing me to tell you. As a matter of fact, my dad did show up at the board meeting dressed as Mussolini. Oh, shit. And gave a whole speech. So my God. And what was the speech? What, I hope it wasn't that he was a good dictator. He just gave one of Mussolini's speeches. He he said he was just trying to do a strong impression. I would. I mean, the, the whole community was offended at the time, though, Joe. I bet they were, but they did. Wait a minute. But they didn't try to get rid of all the books. No, they asked my family to move out of the community. <laughs> and they specifically my dad, we could stay. No, 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 I'm joking. Obviously, you make a great point. You make a great yeah. point about about yeah. like this idea of white guilt. I do think, though, however, 
you know, from what I've learned that there's a difference between, you know, saying you're not racist and actually being anti-racist. And while I was working with you, when I was working with you at Sirius XM, I didn't feel guilty about how well I had done there. But I would have felt bad if I didn't try to open doors for people who weren't like me, which is why I'm super proud of like. The, the work that I did there in terms of I won't I won't even yeah. name drop names, but I'm proud of the of, of what I well, did. You to- should be. Absolutely. Because it's it, like you and you are 100 percent correct. It's not good enough to say I'm not racist. You have to ask answer that and you want to be able to say I am anti-racist. And 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 that and, and that see people say, well I'm not racist, but are you anti-racist, which means am I willing to do what I have to do? To, to defeat it. What 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 has happened is that some people, particularly these Trumpers, man, and, and these these uh, white supremacists, these extremists that are out here, they're trying to flip the script and on you and me. Yeah. So if you and I fight racism, they then say we're racist. But you can't fight. You can't be what you're fighting. Right. Right. You can't. Right. Be, you, that, that is so stupid. Uh, and, and ignorant, but it's a way of them trying to flip the script. The only thing I would say to you is, is you know, because uh, is, is look, at, and this goes where we began. There, the difference between, and and let me let me say this as you struggle on with with everything you're trying to do, and it's and it is you you're a great ally. A, a professor once said to a group of students who are demonstrating and they were having their moments. They, they, he said, look, folks, look, young people, there's a difference between a moment and a movement. And the young, ch- the young student said, well, professor, what's the difference? And he said, um, all movement require sacrifice and that's what i say to what you're doing and and what i'm doing as we started off this discussion yes it is a sacrifice but people sacrifice more than a ham sandwich and well, and, and, and 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 all movements require sacrifice I greatly appreciate that parable and think it's true, but I, I almost feel like I've got to push back that I've made no sacrifice. I, I, I am, uh, you know, it's, it's my, it's my life's purpose to try to, to, to do the right thing, to role model the right behavior for my kids. I have not really given up. Have I given up my time to do this? Sure. We meet, we have meetings, but I, but I enjoy working and organizing with people. And, and so there, there, there could be more sacrifice that all of us could make, but I, I still feel rewarded by the work to try to fight injustice rather than feeling like I'm, I'm making a, a sacrifice. And I'm, if I'm going to be honest with you, I met a whole bunch of really cool people in my community that are like minded that I that I didn't know were there. I thought I was just surrounded by, you know, Trumpers. And then you meet all these other people. So it, it, it has been more of a reward than than anything else. And it's also been I'll wrap up, say a reward to talk to you. And an honor to talk to you. It's always an honor uh, to talk to you. And I would extend this invitation. I will talk to you every week as much as you want, whenever you want, as long as you are doing this to bring attention to what you are doing and what you are sure. protesting. And in, and you know what? Uh, I no one is, has has uh, made that offer. Well, and and I appreciate. I really appreciate it because uh, you you could be doing other. You know you could, and I and I will I will do my best to take. The advantage, but I would add you. I would add one more thing, man. You know, you get get these people to push these senators. Don't give up on that. Push them. Hold their feet to the fire. This is what is what is going to take. It really, honestly, is. Hold their feet to the fire, and I and I and that's why I said I'm stepping out on faith. I don't know what's going to happen, but. That's the only way that these folks will change. Continue to lead. I'll continue to follow. And I really appreciate it. A great honor is, is it always has been to be even in your virtual presence, Joe Madison. No 
one of these days I'll come and visit your shack. <laughs> it's a it's a shed. It is not a shack. Oh, I'm sorry. A shed. It's not I'm a sorry, shack. It is a shed, <laughs> sir. Ah, wow. <laughs> Thank it you, Joe. It looks like a shack. But <laughs> you got no. Go ahead. You got a you got more to say about my shed? Well, only thing. I, well, let me see. I have to look around and see. Oh, look at the cute dog. Look at the. You got something to dog. say about my dog? Oh, well, he's multicolored. <laughs> That's the only way we have <laughs> <Me> some mutt. <laughs> and don't and don't misgender my dog either. She doesn't appreciate oh, that. Oh, she <laughs> okay. <laughs> she she's a mutt. No, mutt's a smart. Mutt's a smart. No, she's purebred. We would never. We oh, would never. No, <laughs> We're bad purebred people. Mutt. <laughs> she's purebred mutt. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I Joe. Go, man. I'll wife, let you go. Thank Sherry. you very very much. Anytime. Call me anytime. Stand up. There he goes. There he goes. Joe Madison. Check him out on the Twitter and support him at Madison. Sirius XM is his Twitter handle, by the way. Joe Madison dot com. Day 18, if you're listening on Thanksgiving, of his hunger strike. I hope you appreciated that. And I am forever grateful for Joe. I hope to have him back on next week and the week after. Love talking to that guy. Always a treat. And he made so many very good points. A real living legend. So uh, a real honor. Hopefully he's not mad at me. Okay, that's it. I've all I got for you here on Thanksgiving Day. I hope you have a great day with your family and eat your face off and enjoy yourself and laugh and drink and do whatever you do with the people that you love and care about the most. I'll be with my family, enjoying my mom, my dad, my brothers coming up, and uh, Val and the girls all together in snowy Syracuse, New York. If you're there, look me up. I probably won't be going out, but maybe. I don't know. I know a lot of you are... uh, old friends or, or listen in the, in the central New York area if I haven't met you. Always great to meet new people. Okay, that's it. That's all, that's all I've got for you. John Carroll singing us out as he does each and every day. Show your face of every color, yellow, black, red, and brown. She's the place where every lost child will finally be found. There's only one thing to do before we stand our ground and that's stand up. Stand up. Well, the founding fathers saw a land for all they had to stand up, they had to stand up. They had a keen imagination for a crystal ball, drawing all the plans of the stand up. But all they had to go on was the time they were in, with other causes for laws and sins they weren't even sin. They knew that change was going to come before the change would begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got the devil square in the eye. We gotta let him know it's his time to go to make it clear when all we hear is a lie. Why you lying awake wondering where the money all went? It'll be the cost of freedom that'll go on its way. If you can see him flee the scene of that experiment, if you can stand up, stand all right, up. we got to speak up. And raise your voice in every way you know how Don't be toes up, you got to show up Ain't no better time to do it but now No need to pledge allegiance to no wanton tribe Rise up, show obedience to the voice inside And listen well and it'll 